Mag Junkie Radio with gorgeous George and Go. This is what we do and why we do it, baby. We roll Covering MMA from all over the world, this is the premier stop for all your combat sports needs. MMA Junkie Radio, the only show broadcasting live from the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino in the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. The lights are on and the mics are hot. It's time to get your MMA fix, junkies. Take it away, Big John. Gorgeous George and Goes, are you ready? Junkie Nation, are you ready? Well, let's get it on. From the fight capital of the world, inside the beautiful Mandalay Bay Racing Sportsbook, you are listening to the MMA Junkie Radio Show, the only show that matters. I'm your host, Gorgeous George. With me, as always, is the devious and dastardly goes, our ace co-host. Back east, he's producing. He's back. He's Andre the Giant. What's up, guys? What up, Holmes? Not, not much. much. Not much. It's Thursday, <laughs> June 20th. Kind of a special day, but I'll touch on that later on in the show. Is it something that I should know? Or just for you? No, you shouldn't know it off the top of your head. Most hardcore MMA fans be up there? would not know it off the top of their head. Oh. Like, the actual date when I say the significance of it. Okay. Um, and I wouldn't fault them. I wouldn't go like, oh, you call yourself an MMA? You know, I wouldn't play that card at all. Because... Uh, six hours ago or four hours ago when I came across it, I thought, oh, wow. On social media? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, today is draft day. NBA draft. That's right. Yeah. We Too bad we don't have one. Uh, well, we don't have a number one. I guess we have a number two, though, right? I didn't understand that, though. Because the trade isn't, like, official, right, for a month. So how does yeah, the pick I think, work? I think the commitment is that like the this NBA is just out, holds yeah. on to you it. Ain't, you ain't getting Davis if you don't give us that pick. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think yeah, yeah. That's like actually a great question because it, it it's not one of those where uh, I have like the, you know like here goes the technical answer goes well mm-hmm. the NBA. I mean yeah, obviously I'm not know. saying something that the Lakers are going. He's right. I mean right, I, I'm sure right. there's an answer, but what is like what would but happen? I'm kind of mad that the that the Lakers don't know that had they made it official on July 30th versus July 6th that they would save themselves apparently another 5 or $7 million. Yeah. Like, we got to have a capologist on the team that knows that. There's no reason we should be getting that from the media. And now the Lakers may have to do some other stupid trade just to free that up so they can get somebody else. But this isn't the NBA channel. This isn't Channel 86. This is 156 Fight Nation. We talk about everything in combat sports, including bare knuckle. Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship 6 is on Saturday, and we got one of the guys who's going to be competing on the card who's well-known. We know him through the MMA circles. Uh, he fought in the UFC. Uh, he's fighting Reginald Barnett Jr., and this is the conclusion of the lightweight tournament that started in October 2018. So the winner will win the tournament and become their lightweight champion. Joining us now on the hotline is Johnny Bedford. Hey, Johnny, welcome back to MMA Junkie Radio. How you doing? I'm um, well, man. Thanks for having me again, guys. It's been a while. I appreciate you having me on. Brother, it's been a while. You're right. But I'll tell you what. I was watching that press conference, and I thought, okay, check out these fine gentlemen here sitting there kind of quiet and respectful, and everyone's chilling. Yeah, and I and I knew Polly and Artem were going to get into it at some point. But, man, you let things off. You and, and, and I'll tell you what. It worked. I got really, really fired up. You started kind of laying into uh, Reginald Barnett, and, you know, he fired back as well. But I, I, that was one hell of a press conference. It was, uh, yeah, it was fun. Uh, I, I've had fun this week, you know, leading up to a big championship fight. Um, he and I have had quite a few interactions face-to-face uh, through the media. You know, today was the first time really face-to-face, but I feel like uh, – I just beat him up every time verbally, if I'm being honest. I just, uh, I, I don't think he's the, uh, you know, I don't mean this to be disrespectful, but he's just not as quick-witted as I, I'll say that. I won't need to be disrespectful. I think I'm a, I'm a little more intelligent, and uh, I, I speak well, and I'm and I'm confident going into this fight, and I think my, my comments say exactly that, my confidence leading into Saturday night. Mm-hmm. And do you think this got in his head at all? Because, like I said, at first... I found him to be uh, respectful. Everybody was pretty chilling until all of a sudden you got going. He did fire back, but yeah, I'll give you the ten nine on the in the wit department. Uh, but but what I want to know is, do you, do you think this kind of like maybe shook him up a little bit? Kind of took him out of his of his zone that he was in. Um, you know, maybe um, I'm gonna be in his head tonight, tomorrow, and then up until Saturday night. I'm gonna be in that kid's head. And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna push buttons. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be me. I go out there and I and I, 
I'm going to try to break him, but, but part of breaking him is breaking him mentally, right? So um, I think he knows he's, he's, he's losing these quote-unquote debates. Uh, I think he's frustrated. Um, I don't know, you know, what it's going to do to his game plan or anything, but, but it, it, it's all been the same. Everything I've said is, has been truthful. I don't think he – I think we're just different people. We're different types of fighters. Uh, I think he's 3-0 and in bare knuckle just like I am with three decisions. And uh, it's just not what people want to see. They, 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 they want to see people go out there and, and, and try to knock each other's heads off. And I'm not trying to win a decision. I'm not trying to dance around that ring and win decisions and call myself a champion. I'm trying to go forward, and I'm trying to finish him. Where would this rank, Johnny Bedford, on your resume for all of combat sports? The wrestling you did, the MMA you did, uh you know, and the bare knuckle that you've done, because this this completes the lightweight tournament, and you become or the winner becomes the lightweight champion on Saturday night. And I I, I can feel like when you're up there on that dais, you really really are digging. You know, the bare knuckle fighting portion of your career. But you tell us. I really am. Uh, I'm really lucky that, that that bare knuckle has come to fruition. Right uh, at, at a point where I'm still actively competing and and making a run at this thing um i wish bare knuckle would have been around 10 years ago i think i'm kind of tailor-made for this sport uh i I think i'm tougher than most people that they put across that cage you know obviously or across that ring obviously skills matter and 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 everything's gonna matter but i think in bare knuckle i think toughness matters a little more and i just i'll put my toughness against anybody um to answer your first question, I guess, where, you know, with, with everything I've kind of accomplished in combat sports, going up wrestling, and then obviously being in the UFC for a few years, and um, and now, you know, having success in bare knuckle, um, it's really re-energized my, my, my life, my, my career, right? I, I found something that I'm really freaking good at, and uh, it's just perfect timing. Um, to answer that question, I guess, a little more clearly, though, um, I get to wake up Saturday, Sunday morning and for the first time in my life call myself a world champion. Um, so that's, this is the, probably the biggest stage of my life. I've never had that opportunity to walk away from a fight and say I'm the baddest man on the planet. And I think Saturday night I'm going to prove I'm exactly that. <clears throat> I think they're going to get more and more guys that are going to want to make their way towards this sport. And uh, I think I'm going to be the face of this division for a very long time. All right, Junkie Nation, you're hearing him. One of the big stars on the Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship 6 card, headlined by Pauly Malinaji and Artem Lobov. It is a pay-per-view. You can go to uh, www.fight.tv. Of course, you can check your local satellite and cable listings. It's all over the place. And I'm telling you, I've watched quite a few of these, and it does not disappoint Johnny Bedford and his opponent, uh, they're going to be competing for the final of the lightweight tournament that started with eight men in October. And so the winner will be the tournament winner and the lightweight winner. It's Reginald Barnett Jr. is his opponent. All right, let me turn it over to Goes here. Goes, what do you have for Johnny Bedford? Johnny, watching that press conference today, I don't know if it's the best move I've ever made or the worst because now I'm so excited that I can't concentrate on anything else, George. I kind of want to go into like one of them induced comas where I just sleep. And then you wake me up and go, it's on. The it's fights on, are on. Right, right. I'm so excited. And, and one of those things is the heat that's been created between a, a lot of the guys up there on that dais. For you, when there's a little bit of heat, does it make the, the matchup more fun for you? It does. Um, you know, I, I, I'm an emotional guy. I, I, I fight with emotions. You know, that, that, that could be a, a bad thing as well. But I, I think that, you know, being a veteran and uh, – you know, I've done this thing for a very long time. Um, I'm, yes, yes. To answer your question, I get, I get excited. I enjoy the quote unquote shit talking. I guess um, I'm pretty good at it, actually, too. Um, but no, I just, you know, I, I, I the, the press conference did exactly what I wanted. I wanted you, people like you, in the in the combat sports world, to be excited about Saturday night. So you telling me that you want to just sleep and wake up when it's fight night. Like that, that puts a smile on my face. That, that's a win for Johnny Bedford. I think I did what I'm supposed to do. Um, I don't think I was out of line. I didn't say anything that was untrue. I don't think the man 
I think we're just cut from different cloths, and, and, and that's okay. Um, he has an ability to win a fight. He has an ability to win a fight by a decision, unfortunately. He's going to try to dance around that ring and not get into a fist fight with me. I can promise you that. Um, I'm going to go forward. I'm going to – it is not boxing. I can grab a hold of you, and, and I can clinch, and I can – I'm bigger than you. I'm longer than I don't know how Reggie wins this fight. I'm, I, I'm longer than him from the outside, and I'm definitely bigger and stronger than him on the inside with clinching involved. He's just, he's, he's, in, he's in bad shape. I promise that. Johnny, this may be a little bit of a long-winded question, but I heard you refer to him as kid a few times, and I was cracking up because we interviewed you back when people would call you a kid, right? It, w- it was early on, and throughout this whole process now you're the veteran do you like it seems like you're a little bit in his head but this is something like is this something that you kind of learned along the way like in other words did you ever have a a lesson throughout your career where maybe somebody did to you what you did to him today um yeah i mean early in my career right i had i had guys that would be the one that would never take a step back and be the one that's always in your face. And, you know, I, 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 I've said it from the beginning. I'm actually a way better coach than I am MMA fighter and uh, pretty highly successful gym in, in Fort Worth, Texas. And I think, I think I've, I've found my way through coaching, if I'm being honest, with these highly, uh, highly prospected young guys coming up that are just animals, man. Like, you couldn't pay me enough money to want to go across the cage with them at this point in my career. <laughs> but in the gym, I'm able to, I don't want to say break them, but there's, there's, there's something about you getting these young guys' heads. When they, when, they, when they hit you and you keep coming forward not giving them a break, it does something to them mentally. They start doubting themselves. They start, you know, panicking of sorts. And when that shit starts happening, it all goes downhill for them. And I'm just going to feed off that. I'm going to be the guy that knocks you down and put my hands up over your head and looks down at you, maybe talks some shit, makes you think about, do you really want to get up again? Do you really want to get hit again? And I've kind of perfected my craft of sorts, so, you know, kind of using my mental antics with my physical abilities of fighting and kind of put them together, and I'm just having fun at this point. All right, Johnny, last question, we'll, and then we'll wrap up here. And, and, again, thank you so much for your time here. I know you're going to start your weight cut or maybe your mid, mid-weight cut, so uh, – I want to ask you, like, about a year and a half ago when all this came about, did you get the vibe of anybody that even heard, you know, you utter the words bare knuckle or, or just talk about the sport? Even just a year, a year and a half ago, people were like, oh, what? Oh, man, that's too brutal, too violent, too carnal, blah, blah, blah. And here we are, like, 18 months later, and everybody's talking about, okay, you want to you know you want to turn your wrist and you got to you know you got to be efficient with your strikes you got to work that body like everybody's now talking tactics and doing breakdowns i mean i, I think it's pretty cool that the that at least it didn't take you know it kind of took a long time for mma to get accepted by all those that kind of had that opinion but uh bare knuckle like i i am glad that everybody kind of put on their thinking hats a little bit thought it out and saw the the the, the chess match that is bare knuckle fighting you know compared to other sports and and it's standing out on its own and and there's a lot of there's a lot of buzz man there's a lot of pop for this card on saturday it's really big man i'm i'm you know i i fought for the first ever card back in 2018 Mm -hmm. and i did it just as a as a cool chapter in my book there was no tournament being talked about there was nobody knew if this was going to be a one and done thing nobody knew anything um but when i met the promoter that day i told him i you realize, sir, like, this sport is made for me, and I'm going to be the face of your organization. It's just funny that June of 18 was their first show. This will be Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship number six. In 12 months, 13 months, this is their sixth show already. And uh, out of those six shows, I've fought on one, three, five, and now six. Um, be the first guy to obviously win the lightweight title. There's never been one of those before, and I'm going to be the first guy in Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship to become 4-0. There's three of us right now that are three and zero. Me and my opponent, and then the heavyweight champ. Who I couldn't tell you where he's been since winning the belt, but he's also three and zero. There's three of us right now in the organization that are three and zero, and I'll be the only man standing Saturday night that's four and zero. Their knuckle fighting. All right, my man. Well, we look forward to it. I can't wait for this tournament final. Uh, Lieben, he always makes it fun, and Dakota Cochran's no joke. And then we got the main event, Thank and of course they got other fights. So I'm sure you're just as pumped up as a fan and competitor for this fight card on Saturday. 
Man, absolutely. Like I, I went to the press conference today, and you know I, I've done that before with, with being in bigger shows and stuff. But you get back to the hotel, and then you start looking around. And you're like, "There's some really freaking big name guys here that weren't even at the press conference." I mean, you got Joe Riggs, you've got uh, I don't want to give too much Julian Lane. You've got you've got uh, Joey Beltran, Elvin Pritko fighting fighting Jim Ayler's another UFC bet. You've yeah. got uh, the, the Bailey guy, two time world champion in boxing. I mean. This card is freaking stacked from top to bottom. Um, I get to be towards the end, obviously, fighting for the championship. Um, I'm really, you know, fortunate and lucky to be there. And, uh, you know, I'm excited for not only my own, obviously, personal success, but I'm, I- I'm happy to be kind of uh, the forefathers of this sport. Yep. And, you know, that I get to be part of history of sorts. Yeah, exactly. I've told that to the other competitors as well. All right, brother. Hey, uh, safe weight cut, and good luck on Saturday. And thank you again for the time. It was great catching up with you. We look, we really look forward to Saturday watching you compete. Man, I, I appreciate you guys for, for getting me today. It was awesome. So, yes, thanks again for all your support. Everyone out there listening, man, please tune in. Support Bare Knuckle Fighting Championships. If you want to you wanna have a good time on Saturday night, watch us. Uh, watch some people throw down. It's going to be a good night. I promise that. There you go. And there he is, Johnny Bedford. Thank you uh, for your time, buddy. Brutal Johnny Bedford. Uh, That's his Twitter handle, too, if you want to give him a follow. Brutal Bedford. But uh, if you haven't seen the press conference, it shot up. It had like 300 simultaneous viewers. Mm -hmm. And then, boom, it almost headed to 2,000. And I think it all started right around the time he started chirping a little bit. Uh, And then, of course... You know, Polly Malinaji and Artem Lobov kind of had their moment as well. But it, it was fun. I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of tune out of some of the other ones that I watch in MMA. Maybe because I've seen so many of them. But I'm that guy. I'm that guy that loves to hear the trash talk. And, and it, Jeff Houston, the announcer, was not lying. Like, mm-hmm. you could feel, like he said it, and that's something you hear in pro wrestling, you can cut the tension with a knife. But I'm telling you, because they had security there. And they started kind of taking a step up. Anthony Johnson started moving up, especially when both guys started going to the podium, meaning Loboff and uh, and Pauly. And, of course, those guys can can talk it up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and they've had their incidents. So wait till you even hear the daily debate and and the more I want to add to this. Uh, but it's Saturday night. It's thirty nine ninety five, and I'm telling you, the the low buff Jason Knight fight was something else, man. It was really really cool, and we've said this before. I'm glad Johnny repeated it. He feels like a forefather. Uh, I I just think it's pretty unique. This thing started a year ago, you know, and I don't know how long it'll last. I, I think it can stay here. I really think it, it it can survive. And they've caught some really nice breaks. They've had that epic fight. They reeled in a fish like like. Uh, Polly, like Polly Malinaji. I mean, MMA was doing some of that. You know, MMA like it was a pretty big score to get, uh, like Kevin Jackson or Mark Kerr or mm-hmm. different, you know, black belts from different disciplines. You you always looked forward to th- those announcements, to you know, to see who could come in and, and maybe compete. And then of course there was just some that were flat out surprises. I remember when they said uh, in the next one. So I don't know if I got the numbers right, but UFC eight, Marco Huas. You know, and he was uh, the king of the streets. And mm, you tried to Google as much as you could. Oh, yeah. You're like, what, what, what? <laughs> but, you know, you, you had heard that name, but you wanted to get as much info as him. And so it was great to see those guys at work to try and get the best out there. And, and so that's where these guys are, man. It just reminds me a little bit of 1993, 1994. They're spacing out their shows every two, three months. Who knows? Maybe in 25 years, there's 42 of them. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go. But I'm telling you, I don't think... You'll buy the pay-per-view and then call into this show and go, dude, you just gave me the worst advice. I, I, I don't see that happening. Nah, you, may say, you may say, hey, that's a little a bit of this or a little bit of that, but you won't feel ripped off. I'm telling you, these guys are going to go out there and they're going to compete. It's pretty cool. And you got a, a two-time boxing champion in the main event. You got uh, Artem Loboff, who's headlined you know, a, a few uh, UFC pay-per-views. You got a five-time boxing champion in Antonio Tarver calling the fights. Uh, Stitch Duran's gonna be there, you know. You Dude, Antonio said before in the past something that kind of stuck with me, where he was like, "I don't know if any, if like, if you have, you have to be in a certain type of state of mind to do something like this." He, he's a world class boxer. I know, and, yeah. and he's talking about Paulie Malone. He's like, "I don't know if he wants to do this, dude. Like, something just ain't there for some of these guys." But you know, the Marco Huas comment that you made. Mm-hmm. Did you ever hear what was? The most earth-shattering news that you ever heard 
back in those days where you instantly had to go to Google. I know mine. You want to hear mine while you think of yours? Sure. When Hoist Gracie said, you Hicks think I'm Gracie. good? <laughs> yeah. You should see my brother. I was He's like, He's 10 what? times better than me. He said that. He said Hoist. 10 times better? You think I'm? Yeah, because he said something about his training was so good because brother put him through the ringer. But he says, you think I'm good? He's 10 times better than me. And, oh, man, straight to the internet. What? Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on a second. What's this guy done? And then you see that he's got that mythical 400 nothing record on the streets. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, whatever It takes else. you a while because back then you type uh, Hickson with an H. And then you go, oh, okay. You got to go back, do it with an R. But I would then, say yeah. when Shamrock came over, the second one, Frank. Uh-huh. And they would show those highlights of Pancrase. Remember yeah. him and Boss Rudin? Laughing. Yeah, they're kind of like. <laughs> So I, I think get you know seeing what what they were doing and then just seeing the the oh, tentacles yeah. of combat sports where else it was whether it was Pancrase or NHB or anything like that I just remember going oh my god like you know who who else is out there who can beat who and I remember one where picture your <laughs> somebody said something funny once it was remember a guy named Olden Polonies he played for the yeah, the Clippers Clippers he one time had the NBA uh, rebounding title locked up. Mm -hmm. And he said that he was eating his breakfast, and he said it was cereal. And he looked, and I think David Robinson got like 39 rebounds on the last day of the, <laughs> the last game of the season. He said he dropped his bowl. Like he couldn't – he dropped his breakfast, I think, something like that. Wow. And he took him by .1 uh, to win the rebounding record that year. This was like in the oh. 90s or something like that. But he was like, what? Like how did he do that? And, of course, if you look back, I think some of the teammates were kind of clearing plan. out and letting them, you know, doing a little bit of the tap-ins. I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah. There was a little bit of funny business there. Um, I mean, he d he went after it. Trust me. He went after it. But there was a couple little cute ones there. Yeah, but if you're down 32 going into one game, like, even if that was like it in was the a beginning, lot, if dude. they all went, all right, here's what we're going to do, somebody would have to go, are you sure? That's 32 rebounds. I remember he said, I couldn't finish my breakfast when I saw how <laughs> many he had. Well, you know, when I couldn't finish my breakfast, mm. when I saw that Randy Couture lost to Ensign anyway. Oh, yeah. I was like, what? Because mm -hmm. Couture was the shit here in, in uh, UFC, and I was mad that he wasn't coming back, but some guy in Japan beat him. Hawaiian born, you know, living in Japan. Well, who's this guy? We got to get this guy in an ultimate ultimate. Or, you know, I was all in for UFC. I didn't care anything about what was going on in Japan. But I was like, well, who's this guy? If he beat him, because, you know, it, 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 folks, you don't understand. Hoist Gracie could just pretzel up anybody. And then a couple wrestlers started going, well, if I don't leave my arm here or I don't leave my head trapped here and just do this, maybe I can ride them out. Oh, wait, I can maybe use an elbow here. You know what I mean? They're figuring out that puzzle. And then there's a few kickboxers like, well, hold on a second. If I get taken down and I don't let the wrestler do this, maybe I can do that. And then here comes a guy that says, wait a minute. You mean if I just absorb some punishment for about 10 minutes, but then out cardio that guy and his hands are down, then I can light up. I mean, it was all just puzzle solving. And uh, but but you felt like that was going to take decades for someone to figure out, you know, how to not get caught in, in jujitsu or, or get grounded and pounded. I mean, especially when headbutts were allowed. Remember Mark Coleman would get you down? Mm -hmm. And if you bet the other guy, you'd just rip up your ticket. It was like Because he'd take you down and just boom, headbutt him, boom, headbutt him. And the other guy's face would just turn into like hamburger, man. And you're like, oh, my God, it's over. But anyway. Whole whole digression there. Sorry, fun to, fun to relive though. That relive all that. Well, it all it all came up because your question. I wanted to ask Artem this question yesterday, but I thought it was so funny that being a mixed martial artist, you have to live through this generation of people going, "Oh, that sport, that's too brutal," and all that. I actually wanted to ask Dana White this too, but now you got bare knuckle, and it's like they're going through that, and almost MMA is kind of looking at them like, "I don't know, who's gonna get a screw loose?" You know what I mean? Like. It's kind of funny that, that now somebody else has to go through that. And really, when you watch it and you speak to, like, cut men and doctors, they're like, it's actually not as bad as people think. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Lobov's name, and even though we didn't catch up with him, we have a little bit of audio from him. So, tell you what, let's take this break and reset. When we come back, we'll listen to that. Uh, Lobov talking to the Mac Life earlier this week, talking about uh this fight with Polly Malinaji and why it means so much to him it's MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation channel 156 stay close we'll be right back
will destroy you. Just ask Three Finger Eddie and Pete the Penguin. Who are they, you ask? My point exactly. They are Gorgeous George and Goes. And this is MMA Junkie Radio. Tonight, following the conclusion of the NBA draft from Brooklyn, tune in to NBA Radio for full post-draft coverage. Hear interviews with the newest NBA draft class, expert reaction, and more on NBA Radio Series 207, XM86 and streaming on your phone and at home on Sirius XM connected devices and speakers. Has it started yet, guys? Yeah, they're like on pick uh, nine. Okay, so who went after Zion? The guy uh, from Duke? No, no, the guy from uh, Murray State. Ah, uh, okay. All right, I don't know who that is. You know, I don't think... Uh, I'm going to say it right now. I don't think Zion's going to be as good as people think. Oh, are you sure? Yeah. He's a freight train, man. He's athletic and has that size like that. It doesn't look like it's holding him back, you know, from mm-hmm. from being like fluid and having a, a soft touch as well. But you never know. I mean, I'm I, not going to say he's a bust. It's not like there hasn't been other ones and twos and threes. Just the other day I was schooling uh, Dan Tom. I, it was Dan Tom. I think I had to tell him. Wait, somebody. You having the Sam Bowie Yeah, the Sam Bowie conversation yeah. because Jordan went number three. Michael Jordan went number three in 1984. Number one was Fourth. Hakeem Olajuwon. So Houston was happy with that. Chicago obviously was happy with that. But Portland could have been the team that took Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. And imagine how that would have changed the trajectory of those two franchises. Instead, they go, <laughs> the we'll take Sam Bowie, who was like 7'1", seven, 7'2". Seven, and just I think he had foot problems, and he just never got over them. And that was that. Mm-hmm. All right. So, telling you how pumped up we are about uh, Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship 6. And, yes, we know there's Bellator. They're in London. The UFC's in South Carolina. But uh, I want to still continue a little bit with this because, look, there's a lot of spillover from mixed martial arts onto this fight card. Like Johnny Bedford was telling us, who he fought, he himself fought in the UFC. Joey Beltran's on the card. Julian Lane's on the card. Artem Lobov's on the card. Chris Lieben, the crippler. I mean, that's a favorite of a lot of people. He's on the card. Did you see that stare down too? Yeah. Intense. Damn, man. Yeah, he All looks, of them. He looks petrifying. I mean, he's like l- looking into your into your soul. But here is Artem Lobov describing what this fight actually means to him. This is courtesy of the Mac Life. No, I don't think I've ever felt about an opponent this way before. That's for sure. Uh, normally, it's business, you know. He needs me and I need him to get paid, you know, this is how we feed our families, this is our profession, this is the job that we do. But, you know, this guy has crossed the line uh, many, many times a long, long time ago, and he will be punished for it. Well, yeah, I mean, slapping and spitting. And I'll tell you what, in both of those instances, I I still thought that that wouldn't be the end of it, that somehow once the press conferences were over or whatever, Mm-hmm. or the media workouts were over, that so, there was going to be a headline that said, part two in an alley, we're in the parking lot. For Artem to just say, like, okay, he got me, but I'm not going to spoil this media thing or mess things up for David Feldman, the president, or, or, or take it further, that was pretty amazing restraint. You know well, what I mean? Well, that and Anthony Johnson got upgraded that from too. being the guy holding the phone to now being right in the middle of the two. Well, he was holding back Paulie. But, yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, by then, the, the, the you know everything was there. But, uh, man, I mean, uh, like I say, I'm, I'm pretty pumped up. And, you know, you just got to tune in on Saturday to see who wins between Pauly Malignaggi to Artem Lobo. It sucks because Pauly is making it a little bit of boxing and MMA. And I don't mind them promoting it that way. But, uh, you know, we're also trying to say that this is kind of a, a different sport in itself as well. Um, and, and so it's, I'm just looking at it as, I mean, I guess that's, I man, you know what, what, why am I going to argue? Why am I even going to try and paint something that's not there? It is boxing versus MMA, you know, and, uh, sort of, huh? Sort of, I guess. I mean, we're just, we're in its infancy for us to really, I mean, like it, this is a sport. I mean, I'm not saying that it isn't, but to convince others that mm-hmm. th- this is where we're at. I'm, I'm thinking about 1993 where people were like, are you crazy? You know what I mean? So. Why go through all that? I I can just turn on the TV on Saturday and just enjoy it. And the hell with all of you that elect not to do it. It, Not to do it. You're missing out. It's just a little different because early on, like in the UFC, if you look at James Toney versus Randy Couture, at least you could say, hey, man, both guys at one point were probably one of the best at what they did, right? Uh They were both champions. Um, If you look at this matchup, Paulie was a good boxer, 
might even say great, but he was he wasn't like elite, right? Mm -hmm. And Artem wasn't elite mixed martial artist, so it is boxing versus MMA. But I don't know that it's anything that you can either way can claim scoreboard. All right, let's continue the discussion here via the daily debate. The brothers Garcia seemingly can't agree on anything. Everybody knows it's duck season. Rabbit season. Duck season. Rabbit season. Whether it's food. Last filling. Tastes great. Last filling. Tastes great. Gambling. Always bet on black. I like red. Black. Red. Black. Red. Black, dummy. Or even social media. Instagram. Snapchat. Instagram. Snapchat. The same applies to the biggest stories in MMA. Time for MMA Junkie Radio's Daily Debate. All right, today's daily debate question for the MMA Junkie Radio team, a.k.a. Goes and I, for today. Three big combat sports headliners go down this weekend at hashtag UFC Greenville, which is the South Carolina show, hashtag Bellator London, and hashtag BKFC6. Which one are you most hyped about? Hanato Moikano versus the Korean Zombie. Good That's fight. the one in the UFC, featherweights. Gegard Mousasi versus Rafael Lovato Jr. Rafael Lovato Jr. Uh, that one's in London. That's a title fight. Mm -hmm. Pauli Malinaji versus Artem Lobov at Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship 6. Goes. This one, I don't want to say it's a slam dunk because the other two are actually pretty good fights. All right. But what they've done over at Bare Knuckle is they've made it impossible for you not to to you have to know the outcome of this fight it's not even so much that i'm looking at artem's skills versus paulie's skills just one of them is going to shut up one of them is going to make the other one shut up after everything they've been through i have to know how this is going to end but the zombie man the zombie in your ear you forget that one well i'm gonna the make zombie a case. in anybody have you forgotten that one have you forgotten you're an mma analyst i know that hosting an mma radio show thing. Those and guys, Renato Moicano, he's pretty amazing himself. The other two MMA fights, they can happen again. There can be rematches there. I don't think that there could be a rematch in this. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those situations where I don't know that Pauli Malinaji, even if he gets a victory here, is going to want to do something like this again. So this is like one and done. You get to see it, and that's it. What about Musashi and what he's doing? Pretty historical, winning titles in different organizations, and this would be a title defense versus an undefeated amazing grappler and, and he's also kind of has a little bit more gangster swag the, these last few years if it were up to me and i wouldn't get fired for this i would have somebody come up from behind choke me and hopefully i would go out until saturday and then somebody pours a bucket of water on me and goes it's on and I, get to, I get to watch the burn so the anticipation fight. is killing you. I, it's it's actually killing i haven't been like this for a fight in a really really long Time. I'm so excited. Did the uh, press conference cement that? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. But the only thing I don't like about it is it's making me pick a side a little bit in boxing versus MMA. Yeah. I kind of like. I like them both. I really like what they've both done. So do I. I. And uh, I I respect what they've both done. So I was going into this thinking oh, I don't want either guy to lose. I like them both. But now they've kind of made me pick a side. It, it's a weird feeling, but I just can't. I know that the when the night comes and the fight starts, I'm going to be nervous. I'm going to have goosebumps, and I can't say that about the other ones. Well, I was pushing back as Joe MMA fan because I'm with you, Goes. Honestly, uh, I just love the tension between those two guys. And how about the fact that part of that fight may have been birthed here on this show? Mm -hmm. Just the fact that Pauli Malignaggi, when he walked in, he didn't have much to say about bare knuckle, but what came out wasn't that complimentary and we had the bare knuckle fighting championship president here david feldman who was very respectful he had brought chris lytle over you know they were promoting the cancun show yeah and but paulie knew how to restrain himself because he was here honestly as a showtime boxing analyst he came by of course we talked a little bit about conor mcgregor we got into salaries and things like that and then boom next thing you know they're having a chat boom next thing you know they're in the promoter fighter business together and of course artem goes out does his thing has that great fight versus jason knight and here we are but yeah in 2017 they were all in that camp man for mcgregor versus mayweather and so these guys have been beefing and crossing paths for for a while now and, and I, i'm with you on this one i'll tell you what the moicano zombie fight uh got some votes they pushed back in mm -hmm. second place musasi lovato weren't that further back as well but 
uh, almost double uh, was Malianaji and Lobov. And, and there's actually some voting still going on as we're taping this, so I'll, I'll leave those percentages to be. But it looks like Malianaji Lobov will win this pretty handily. And, you know, the sample size is probably going to be about 1,000 votes. So there you have it. Can't argue with that. That's today's Daily Debate brought to you by the MMA Junkie Radio team. And with that, we're going to take another quick break. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 156. We also got some uh, MMA news to discuss, a big injury Go that's going to hurt take the call. one of the two divisions. Right. Isn't that true? Yeah. What happened? I don't know. What did you say, Andre? <laughs> Are we in commercial? Oh, Mark on Wake goes on, on and he wants to talk. Ah, right now. Yeah. Oh, we're we not in commercial. Marco All right, Marco from Waco, what's going on? Marco from Waco, what's up? What's up? So, what fight are you looking for more this weekend? By far, the Malanagi Lola fight, man. He, he got all the hype. That, uh, unbelievably enough, I don't even like VKFC, you know. I, I don't I think it's a complete product, but I want to watch his fight. And, uh, the second fight for me will be Korean Zombie versus uh, Moicano. Uh, on a third fight, uh, freaking uh, Musashi, Lovato Jr., because I think uh, there is levels to this shit. Uh, Lovato Jr., yes, he's 9 and 0, but Musashi is one of the best middleweights we've ever seen, dude. And they gave me, they gave me the phone, take a delay? I'm sorry. Now, I, I'd, I'd rather watch it live. And, and if they want to give it to me on take a delay, I'm going to watch the fight on Sunday for Musashi. Peace out, guys. All right, Marco. We'll see you. What were you going to say, Goes? Well, I was going to ask him, does... All right, did the Artem Loboff-Jason Knight fight make you already want to watch this fight? Or did it have nothing to do with, like, was it just the strictly the trash talk between these two guys? Because um, what they did in that last fight really made me, like, regardless of who was going to headline this one, mm -hmm. I probably would have tuned in anyways just because... Lobov is now like that type of bare knuckle fighter where you're like, I ca I can't miss him. Mm -hmm. He did that with him, him and Jason Knight. So I was just curious where Marco stood on that. Yeah, well he's but gone. he took off. He's gone. Yeah. All right, we're gonna go to break now. If Andre will allow it, is that cool with you, Andre? <laughs> or oh, it's you want to take the cool. show in another direction? Just it's all, <laughs> you're calling the shots today, brother. No, it's all good. It's all good. So we're going to a break. It's official. Andre the Giant has given us permission to go to break. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 156. We will be right back.
in the second round and then stops Mirage. My name is Triple C, Olympic champion, flyweight champion of the world, and now bantamweight champion of the world. I have the greatest combat actor of all time, and I just stole the title for the best pound for pound fighter too. Put excellence and excitement in your Vitamix, add ice, and you get MMA Junkie Radio. What'd you think of that, by the way? It's when funny. He, when, he, when he won, but then all of a sudden kind of went into that little promo, and now hearing it back, what are your thoughts? It's funny. I don't know. I mean, he makes me laugh. Right. I don't get But upset. that moment was pretty serious. Like, it seemed like he was speaking from the heart. Mm-hmm. Like, he's... But you never now he's demanding his respect. You can't huh? give yourself a nickname, right? So I, lo- but like, I, uh, I like it, though. Triple C cracked me up. So I, 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 I also believe in that a little bit, but... Um, I, I don't. It could be that the guys had been telling him that, and that was just his chance to put it on the map. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Um, but when he said it, I was like, "Triple C, okay, I can ride with that one." You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Uh, but it looked like he was demanding his respect. But there was no one that could go. Hold on a second. Hey, you mean to tell me there was none of that? It was his moment. <laughs> he had just won a second title on the heels of beating the previous bantamweight champion, who was enhanced. And that was also a title defense. And on the heels of evening the score with Demetrius Johnson, because they're 1-1, but just beating Demetrius Johnson. Like, the run that he's had has been pretty damn incredible, man. What I don't want is for him to admit that some of it's cringeworthy. Or it. I don't want that. Like, I'm kind of getting a kick out of him just doing it and just going through See that through picture it. with the Bella Twins? Yeah, like, it, it's funny. It pops up every now and again, yeah. and, like, ah, he cracks me up. Yeah. I don't know how long that's going to last, but for now, like, I'm he. I'm kind of cracking up with it. Yeah. No, I really play that one more time. Can can you? Is that easy to retrieve, Andre the Giant? Big elbows from Cejudo. Oh man, I thought the referee was gonna stop it. Oh, yes. That's it. Give him the second belt. Andre Cejudo is the UFC bantamweight champion. What a comeback from that first wow. round! It looked like the loss was inevitable. Henry turns it around completely in the second round and then stops Marat. My name is Triple C, Olympic champion, flyweight champion of the world, and now back to my champion of the world. I have the greatest combat actor of all time, and I just stole the title for the best pound for pound fighter too. See, like some of it doesn't make good. sense, right? Like he he didn't steal the title. I mean, he legitimately won it. He was he wasn't the favorite, so I guess maybe you can sell that. And well, I don't no, know no, no, no. I stole the, the title of pound for pound. Is what he said. Stole the title? Yeah, so whoever has it right now, whether your argument's DC, John Jones, Demetrius, Khabib. I'd say I took it. I don't want to say it. I wouldn't say I stole it because then it seems like you didn't earn it, right? He earned it. But I don't know. It's just the things he says are, are just kind of weird. Do you, Okay, remember yeah. the, the late, great Owen Hart? Yeah. He's a great wrestler. Mm-hmm. When he became the Blue Blazer towards the end, I was kind of like, well, why'd you do that, you know? But then... He would just kind of crack me up, like being silly as right. the Blue Blazer, and, uh, and then it just turned into ah, it's just Doan. That's how I feel like with Henry Cejudo. I just kind of look at him, and every once in a while, I'll say something, and I go, "What? Yeah, it's just Henry," and I start laughing. Hmm. I'm into it. But you're a fan. Yeah. Okay. Totally. Yeah. So am I. And uh, I, I wanted to say one other thing. John Anik's final calls from a lot of these fights that he's been involved in. He doesn't have like the most booming voice. You know, mm-hmm. where you where you just have, like, bass, you know, that comes off. But he is smooth, man. And I'm really, really digging how uh, the, the call, the, you know, those calls that he has uh, towards the end of a fight. I, I think he's really, really taken that up to another notch. I, I've always really enjoyed him. And I think he's won a lot of people over, you know, over the years. Because he just keeps getting better and better at everything. Everything that has to do with being the play-by-play announcer for the UFC. I agree. And I think he had a tough road because Dana White had said something about this dream team. And they never really s- said, is that him or did it fall through? But look who we got. And boy, is he a gem. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So and plus They had a him, Jimmy, too, at one point. And like, plus, was that him? Right. There was rumors of a Max Kellerman and a Jim Rome and I don't know, who knows what. But I, I don't know that any of them even would have been there. But I, I just think he's really, really solid, and you know, and he goes up against two titans in Chavello and and Ronaldo because they are, I think, a little bit more pronounced, you know, in what they're saying. 
but uh i mean john annex right there for me that's you know for what i really enjoy mm -hmm. i can appreciate every single thing that everybody everybody brings to the table it's hard to compare him because uh when he came in they gave him a different partner just about every other card right so it, was, it I mean, it's hard like you and i we kind of can work together because we know what each other's going to do we know what each other's going to say he gets a new guy every time and has to do that live on the air and he, was like he also has to do he three, like and that's kind of like Steve Young behind Montana because Goldberg was Montana. Mm -hmm. and remember him and B Brian Stan were just kind of like the B team, we'll call them, mm -hmm. or just the other team. And slowly but surely, they got their little niche going, you know. And then Goldberg wound up leaving, and you know, Anik moves up. And even then, I, I still think he was looking over his shoulder. He never got the big contract, you know. I'm using the the football analogy. Like, am, am I am I going to get paid? You know, the big contract, am I your guy, am I your starter, are you going to draft someone? And then all of a sudden, I think the, real, the UFC realized, holy, holy cow, we got our guy. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, his early final calls weren't like they are now. He's definitely, definitely improved. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the only thing you could say. I just wish he had a little bit more of that, one of those booming voices that some of the other guys have. Uh, but I think slowly but surely, probably working with voice coaches. I, I've, if you watch those, um, what are they called? Final rewinds? No. You know when they come out with uh, the behind-the-scenes footage? Mm -hmm. What's that called? What the UFC produces? I wanted to say backstage, but that's the Lakers. I don't remember right now, but I know what you're talking about. When they show the corners and the families, yeah. that thing. Watch how John... Uh, he kind of like bends over and then stands up so that he can project as much as he can. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so you can just tell that that's work that he's putting in because he has the emotion. He loves the sport. It's just a matter of time, you know. Uh, it's just a matter of being able to project that. You know what I mean? Well, I think another thing that does him a disservice, mm. and it, well, maybe not a disservice. I think he has to. He learned his role as well. Is uh, usually Joe Rogan is very loud in those Joe Rogan's got a yeah he's got a boom so it almost voice. doesn't make sense to have two guys be loud at the same time right. I think sometimes he'll take a step back and Joe's the one that's super loud in that moment so it's a, it's tough you know like where I, where uh Pat Miletic and Michael Chavello worked for so long uh Michael Chavello just you just knew when that moment came he was going to be the louder of the two right. and then Pat would kind of clean right. it up uh Marlon and all the same thing you know Boss Rudin would kind of chill a little bit he would come out so yeah, it takes time for that to happen, but it's a little different. He's working with two other guys too, you know. But sometimes it's a three-man booth. Right, exactly. Uh, all right. Now speaking of Cejudo, the whole reason we we went down this road is if you haven't heard, he had a shoulder surgery. He's going to be out for the rest of 2019. And the unfortunate thing is, a, you know, look, he's a human being. Uh, he's a world champion in two weight classes. So, uh, but but as a human being, you just don't want that on anybody. Uh, but he he is going to have a, he did have the sol shoulder surgery, and I mean, look, we still have half of a year to go, and to know that the flyweight slash bantamweight champion is not going to be able to defend, it makes you think, oh boy, then then why did we do this? What are we going to do? Blah blah blah. And and but but I, I'm not I'm not mad at it, man. I'm not mad at it because look how tough he was to limp in with that sprained ankle and do what he did. Um, he went after history, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. and I love fighters. I love athletes that just roll that type of of dice and go for it. And that's why I didn't even mind when Kevin Durant tried to come to come back because he really w wanted to 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 win and be there for his team and then you know he wound up tearing his ankle or what or whatever but that that was the decision that he made but um what's going to happen? I don't know mad? but huh? You're not mad though? At who? At the situation? I I could care less. I'm not a Warriors fan. What? Wh which situation? With Sohudo? Yeah. No, because what I mean the shoulder injury? Yeah, like what what it's gonna do now? Well, I'm, I'm you know obviously I'm mad that it's gonna hold up two divisions, but Peter Yan and uh, Aljamain Sterling seem to be already kind of making some plans. Yan's pitching an interim title, and I'll tell you what, he's not crazy to pitch that because let's just say Henry Cejudo goes, all right, I'm out the, out of 2019, I'll be there on January 1st. All right, cool. Well, what if he comes back as a flyweight? That means he can't come to back as a bantamweight till at least April. We're only in June. That's ten months away. That's I don't why mind I'm those. Mad. Bantamweights being aggressive and saying, "Hey, let's do this." No, because uh, I need we're in, that, we're in that era, and it was pretty historical. And he actually pulled it off. I'm gonna be cool with it. Plus, maybe he saved flyweights too. If the UFC just comes out and says, "All right, he's gone until this time," but this next fight will be an interim interim fight 
for this division. That, that at least tell us where he's coming back. You think they should do it for Pantoja and Benavides on on the 29th? Maybe if they tell us that's going to be it, then all right, then we know. Okay, this has some direction. Give us some direction is all I'm asking. Right, for. because Cejudo could come back and go, eh, I'm never going to 25. And the whole time we would have been waiting. Else, yeah. Right, so, so they so should make him for the, for the interim. And whoever, if Cejudo never comes back to that division, then he can become, the, that person can become the undisputed. All right. Fun first hour there. But the good news is we got one more hour to go. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 156. Still might have a surprise guest or two. Because I'm telling you, man, I was out there fishing. I had lines in the water. And we'll see. I, I thought I was going overboard for a while there, but the, the confirmations were slow on coming back. So uh, you, you never know. All right. We'll be right back. And don't touch that dial. Good, you're still here. The boys were just getting warmed up. Now the real show begins. Take it away, boys. I was literally just talking to three people right now, trying yeah. to figure things out. Yeah, so we're still he, shuffling things around, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to worry about it any longer. Look, we've had a, a fun week so far. Uh, I don't. I usually wait to do this on Friday, but you know, we already talked to Brian Butler, Rob Font, Leota Machida, Juan Archuleta, Chris Lieben. Richard Hunter came in on both days to co-host. Ian Joy, Johnny Bedford. So and plus we got DC stopping by on Monday. So I'm all right. I'm all right. We're we're, we're going to be okay. We're just going to relax a little bit and talk a little bit about Bellator, UFC, bare knuckle, whatever you guys want to do, man. I am totally game. Uh, I don't even know if I gave out the number early on. If you want to chime in, it's eight seven seven fight ninety three eight seven seven three four 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 eight nine three. Also, the NBA draft is going on. So I'm going to kind of hit a refresh and just see where we're at. Make sure nothing crazy's happened goes. But it looks like they're on pick number 13. Round one, the 13th pick. Been going quick. Yeah, okay. And uh, obviously we're Lakers fans. Uh, we kind I guess we already had our draft pick <laughs> with Anthony Davis. It cost us previous draft picks. but it cost us our roster. What are you going to do? We got a, we got a stud, man. Uh, all right, goes. Did you finish your thoughts on Cejudo? Do you, you like the idea of maybe I'm just two interims because it's the type of injury it's going to take away? That, I don't like it when fighters feel disrespected at that interim too much mm -hmm. because no one's taking your belt away. I think the UFC is just saying, hey, look, man, this is just an insurance. Now, a few of them had, had a case. Like, I remember Tyron had a case because he had had a busy year. And for fights in one year. Yeah, and then all of a sudden they just kind of said, oh, we're, we're running this one. I think it was the RDA Covington one. Mm -hmm. And he was like, wait a minute, man. I haven't been out that long. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. it isn't that crazy. Um, Considering, you know, like, however long, like, Dominic Cruz was out or whatever. And usually people waited a year, but it's a belt for them to promote. And it, this guy's this guy's the champ of two divisions. So when he does come back, he can't come back to both. Mm -hmm. He can only come back to one, which means he's not coming back to the other one for, I think, to, to play it safe, three months. Look, I, I think everything he did, I appreciate it. I thought it was a great moment in history. But I think the way to make things right right now is just to say, look, I'm going to be back. Maybe you can't give a date, but roughly around this time. And when I do, Flyway, where you at? Bantamweight, where you at? Just let us know which direction you're going to go to. Because say he takes a Flyweight fight, okay? 
it doesn't mean that he's going to come out of that 100%. What if he's hurt again? Exactly. I'm right? giving the so timeline of 90 days. Like, you saw how Valentina's got a quick turnaround, right? Mm -hmm. Valentina. you got to give direction to the other guys. I mean, it just it, it kind of sucks. It sucks for the fighters, the organization. That I, I think if he did that, then I would be like, all right, that that, that makes sense. And that's plus, cool. flyweight's got it. That's the best, the two best flyweights who are fighting in a, in a, in a week. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the problem. It's five rounds. Can't do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that one through. Ngannou and DeSantos are the main event, so they're going five. Mm. Unless you turn to them and go, can you go five? And they said, sure. I bet you they would for an interim I think who wouldn't, I right? I think so, too. But look, Valentina Shashenko, who wants to be active, she just fought on June 8th, so literally 12 days ago. She's already going to be defending her title on August 14th. So even that is two months and about a week. She got out of there healthy against uh, Jessica I. But like I say, and, and think about how much we're cutting corners here. We're saying if Cejudo comes back on January 1st mm -hmm. and fights <coughs> and wins, Gets through a camp after the and, injury. And so then he comes back on, what, April 1st. April 1st, and right now is June 20th. That's 10 months. That's too long for one of the two divisions to be being held up. So I think they should go to Cejudo and go, which one would you come to second? Because that one we're going to do a um, an interim. Mm -hmm. And Peter Yan has already suggested that he wants to fight Aljamain Sterling. By the way, do you agree with Brilliant. those two? Yeah, why not? So do I. I'm down with that. Yeah, and I think the, f the top two flyweights are Benavides and Pantoja, who are already fighting next week in Minneapolis. Hmm. Well, I don't know what they'll do, but I, I, I would not mind seeing that situation. Hey, what do you think of Darian Caldwell? Loses his title against Kyoji Horiaguchi, and then he slaps the camera out of the camera operator's hands. Uh, I played it a couple times, and uh -huh. I couldn't get if his frustration was just that the MMA world that's watching, or are the actual operator no, of the camera? I don't did think you, it was. Did you hear? It? Did you turn it up? Yeah, I think he was already pissed off at something else. Uh, it was just the camera operator being there. If you remember a while back, but it wasn't oh, that uh, guy personally. Nah, it's I not like that so. guy's been following him and no, winking at him. Because he was already saying stuff. Uh, Nick Diaz did that one time, right? He didn't slap it completely, but he, he kind of gave it a good slap. Um, anytime Darian's been on our show, he can get fired up. But he never struck me as a guy that's, like, unreasonable. I think he was just really, really fired up. And I bet you, if you ask him if he regret, regrets it, he'd, he'd probably say, yeah, I think at this point. But he, he just was really pissed off. I mean, that, that's a tough thing to go through. And um, th But it's part of the game now. You know, that's what sucks. The – oh, man. Why can't we think of that thing that the UFC does, you know, where they release the – I've never – Fight motion? Is that what it's called? No. I've never, look it up. I've never really liked it too much. Just because uh, if you watch the NBA Finals, they uh, or any NBA game, they will catch a basketball player walking into the tunnel. But once he gets to a certain point, that's it. They let right? it go. They let it go. And that that's the one thing about, like, I get it. They make a lot of money. But they're also people. And I think especially in this sport where it's one-on-one -on -one and it's combat, they have to be given that moment, even if it's five minutes, five, ten minutes, whatever. Mm -hmm. But give them a moment to just be alone where they can just be themselves. Like, I remember one time, was it Jose Aldo that they showed kind of like crying in the corner, mm -hmm. right? I think another time Melvin. That was messed up. Melvin that was when he lost to McGregor. Melvin and. And, uh, and that camera was on him for quite a long time. Yeah. It's not like you can say, oh, we, we messed up. You got to give them something, man. You got to give them something sometime. Uh, Melvin Gallard, I think one time like threw a chair really bad. Like, do that. That that's one of their worst moments ever happening in front of everyone. And I, I think they thrill should be and agony. That. The thrill and the agony. Yeah. The thrill and so the when agony. they go through the back, they go and they get their med. They go to the medical station and they get checked. And then from there, I think they're free to kind of go to the locker rooms or whatever. But man, that or just, they'll go to sucks, UFC dude. a UFC interview. Or they have sometimes. to take a picture. Yeah. So that yeah. that book that that you guys purchase. Those pictures come from that moment. They take the the quick picture of what they look like afterwards. Some of them get in the book, some of them don't. But it just sucks, dude. It, it really does. I'm not trying to make excuses for Darian. I, I think I would imagine he probably regrets that. But uh, I, I kind of get where he's coming from, too. 
Now, let me ask you a question that just occurred to me. And this is one that I've gone back and forth on. So I may give a, an answer that the audience has previously heard me going in another direction. But let's package everything up that you just said. Darian Caldwell slapping that camera. Mm -hmm. Nick Diaz slapping the camera. The incident in Brooklyn with the, the dolly and the bus. Khabib and the slap. The spitting. Do you... Are you okay with all that? Did some of those cross the line? Did all yeah. of them cross the line? Um, where do you stand on just the the antics of what our athletes, you know, in and out of the cage? You know, Khabib jumping over and that riot that ensued. Like, mm -hmm. where where are you out? Think of the well, even, even go back to <laughs> even go back to Nashville. You know, when uh, Mayhem Miller got jumped by Shields and the Diaz brothers, mm -hmm. or over here. Um, at Planet Hollywood with the Russians in the 209 that we saw. Mm -hmm. All that. I mean, that, you know, I'm not going to go on for days. There's a lot of different lines. Yeah. But one of the major lines that really upsets me is if I pay a ticket and say I'm bringing my son to his first MMA event, I should never have to worry about his safety. I'm not fighting. I'm there to watch. I have a hot dog. I have popcorn. I got my little kid with me. He's going to remember this the same way I remember going to see Roddy Roddy Piper and Hulk Hogan at the forum with my pops. I want it to be a good memory. But I there's don't a difference ever between want him to be in danger. But there's a difference between the one of the Diaz coming up going, is that your kid? Whack! Versus something happened and we fell and maybe we spilled the coke on your kid or whatever. That's kind of more what I'm talking but there's, about. But there's people in the, like no in one's the going audience there with the are coming in, right? I mean, with like the intention people of hopping over. Eh, it just can't happen, man. I'm really? Not, I'm we should have done the debate that. about this because I'm on the other side. Lately, I've been thinking about it. And, of course, I never want anyone to get hurt. Mm -hmm. I'll say that first. But I've been thinking about it. And I guess I'll steal a line from Dana White. It's the fight business. And I've just kind of come to accept that it's what's going to happen. And I, I'll tell Why you don't you do this. it? Why don't you? When you're really – yesterday you were pissed off. Mm -hmm. Say you were pissed off at Richard. Why don't you take Richard out there and punch him in the face? Because <laughs> there's penalties, right? Uh -huh. You know if you do that, there's a good chance you could get fired, you could go to jail, right? But if that penalty wasn't so strong, if it was just kind of like somebody's going to come over and go, Oh, George, don't do that again. You might take that chance and give Richard a big pop in the face, right? If the penalty were strong enough, they wouldn't do that. I promise you fighters wouldn't do that. How many times in the history of combat sports? It's happened. I'm not saying it has, hasn't. But how many times has it actually come to a punch in a face-off? Like the day of so even when McGregor was like throwing that, those waters, money's on the line. Even when McGregor was throwing those waters and stuff, what happened there? Yeah, dude, can't be. Oh no. Well, yeah. I mean, I kind of giggle at that, but uh, like if my kid got hit in the head with a water bottle, I'd be pretty pissed. You don't go to a baseball but, uh, game and we'd hope probably be laughing on the way home. A brawl might fi uh, happen that night, or go yeah, to a hockey game. but they're on game. the field. There's a big separation between that. They'd have to climb up and get up, get to me, mm -hmm. which my fat ass is usually up at the top anyway. That's what I'm saying is that stuff between them. Yeah, some stuff might spill over like the MGM or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about just crazy things that happen maybe backstage. Well, that's what I'm telling you. The only time I have a problem with it is when they cross those lines. Oh, like, okay. Like the Detroit Pistons. So Caldwell slapping the camera, you, you're you okay. I mean, I don't like it, but I get where he's coming from. Right. That's what I'm getting at is I, I – it doesn't bother – I guess Spit, right, I don't like spitting. I guess spitting right now I, I, uh, it doesn't bother me too much. You, uh, I'm not asking for more of it. But I go into every way and in hoping that someone will get a shove. Oh, yeah. I, okay I don't want to headbutt because I, I want the fight to happen. So I don't want someone mm -hmm. to headbutt and then someone's eyes split open and then the doctor waves that fight. I don't want that. I just want intensity, you know, or something like that. Uh, yeah, that, that, that'll that carry over for the next 24 okay. hours. You like bare knuckles? Because I love the buildup of the fight, not just the fight. Yeah. Okay. I like it, too. Didn't you like Affliction when it was around? Yeah. But you saw what the loss of one fight did to an entire card, right? Mm -hmm. They lost that fight. The whole thing went under, okay? Who knows what's invested into this fight? If all the payoff I'm going to get is a slap or a spit, I'd rather see them fight, dude. I don't want something like that to happen where you either lose out on the fight or, or you bankrupt an organization. It's just not worth it to me. Spitting, I get Like, I don't hate if somebody gets spat on. Is that what it is? Spat on or spit on? Spit on. Spit on. If somebody gets spit on, but they're in a spat. Uh, I don't have a problem <laughs> with it. If they, if they, if they turn around and deck the guy, that's what he gets, dude. When you spit on someone, that's like the worst 
thing you can possibly do to a human being. If an MMA fighter spit on me, I'm nobody. But I will fight that guy. I don't care who it is. If he spits on me, that's it. Even if Nganu had done it to me. If Nganu two had Fridays done it to ago? me, it wouldn't have ended there. All right? Coach, he he would have KO'd me here. He would have put his hand on your forehead and you would have been swinging Not at the air. Not because he would have never thought that I would hit him. But if somebody spits on me, that's it. You would have walked over with your hands behind it's your back. The like, worst like, thing somebody could like do. Like George Masvidal, just real calmly. The only like thing I could think of. No, nah, yeah. What'd you think of that one? Masvidal and Leon Edwards. Do you wish it wouldn't have happened? I wish it wouldn't have happened. I liked it. But uh, I don't like that. Ru- I, I have nothing against that. It was Leon Edwards that got lit up. I'm not saying, like, take that, Edwards. I'm just saying that that event had something that spills over. And, my, you know, again, he, he, you know, he did get opened up. Mm-hmm. I've seen that a few times. He's a big boy. He's over it. He's already healed. I saw him do some interviews when they were, you know, recently. But see, George is like a different breed, all right? I don't, what I don't understand is how people didn't know that was going to happen, okay? Even That's why Dana White was Leon mad at security, Edwards. and he wasn't mad at George. How did Leon Edwards not know that was going to happen? When you see George Masvidal get up and walk like that, and you know what you just told him, he's going to fight you. It'd be a shock if he didn't. I don't know how those people didn't know that was that wasn't gonna happen, especially him walking with his hands behind his back. Like now that I think about it, I knew exactly when he when as soon as he put his hands down and started walking, he's gonna fight. He's Jorge Masvidal. He tells you who he is. He tells you everything about him. He tells you, "Don't mess with me. I'm gonna knock you out." Can you name more incidents? Uh, Tank Abbott and Alan Goez. Remember that one? Pat Smith Pat and the Tank Abbott gang in the, in the elevator. elevator. Paul Herrera. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know which one? I mean, what we hey, s- what we started saying so many with like with MGM and Nashville. I was like, holy cow, we've had a lot in our sport. The other day, I saw a picture of Pat Miletic, w- I think with Ron Kruk and Tank Abbott. But do you remember he told the story one time? I'm almost positive he told it. I'm praying otherwise he's gonna slap me. Uh, wasn't it a story where Tank slapped him and then took off running and then he started chasing him like Johnny Utah style? Do you remember that? He yeah, told I just the story don't remember if he told it on the air. But I, I could have swore at the end of the story, we asked him, like, so is everything done? He was like, no, nah, we're going to have a talk next time. But there they <laughs> were taking a picture. And I was like, man, did they have that talk or what? Uh, what happened in England, right, with uh, Tito Murray. Ortiz and, and Lee Murray? Uh, there's been quite a few. The Hicks and Gracie and uh, Hugo Duarte? and Shoji. Well, then well, the, the guy that came off the plane straight from Japan mm. uh, and fought him in... in, in uh, in the back West room. LA, yeah, and then yeah, the beach. There's incident. a tape of it. Nobody Hen- gets a tape. Henzo Gracie, and I think that's like the Ark of the Covenant, as yeah, far probably, as like huh? MMA tapes. Uh, what did I just say? Oh, Eugenio Tadao and Henzo Gracie. Wasn't there a? S- didn't someone get stabbed? Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, somebody had a knife. Uh, I'm probably what about Henzo I'm, and I the think some of the stories are bleeding over. Remember the uh, the chairs and the riot and the thing in the in the ring? Oh yeah, yeah. We got to be missing some though. No, I'm sure we are. Okay, do you want to get you since since we're freestyling a little bit here? Um, do you want to hear about the? Remember, I told you I had a little fun fact. That yeah. I wanted to spring on everybody. I can't remember it, but I saw something today on on Twitter. I think where I went. Oh, really? Yeah, I think that might be it then. That I was just my don't remember what it too. is. All right, you want to hear it? Yeah. How about when we come back after this break? You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM Fight Nation Channel 156. When we come back, I will tell you guys about an event that produced two uh, historical. Mm sequences of action in mixed martial arts and it involves big names it's not like i'm going to say he was at the fairgrounds in alabama it's gonna be a good one so (laughs) don't touch that dial
Jokes aside, George and Ghost are some of the best chicks I know. Heh. <laughs> Here we go with more verbal sparring. Take it away, ladies. Man, this is some bullshit. What just happened right now? I hope I didn't close my window. Nah, I'll be alright. I'll figure it out. It is MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 156, and we're live from the Mandalay Bay Race and Sportsbook. In, uh, we are one of the MGM resorts here. MGM resorts is uh, Mandalay Bay, Luxor, Excalibur. Hit us up, man. If you're ever in town, go to their social media. Mandalay Bay, it, it's Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, forward slash, uh, excuse me, dot com, forward slash Mandalay Bay. And that's where you can get your best deals. But we invite you to stay here and stop by the studio and hang out with us. Give us enough time. We'll do our best to have an MMA superstar here for you to meet. So bring that camera. All right. I will find it. Oh, no, no. I, I'm, not, I'm not buying time on that one. No. Um, I'll do the read uh, on the next one. Oh, he wants to read now? No, no, I'll do the read on the next one. He already fumbled our... <laughs> <laughs> Our, uh, Marco? Yeah. I mean, he Andre punked us on How that could one. you possibly have this many windows up? Like, oh, there we go. What is it that you look at? Because I don't know why it goes. Look at this. Have you heard of this? Yeah. Where you just have a... How, why does it do that? Why do I have a new desktop? I don't know. Uh, it I only happened to me once. I've been there I like, in where in the hell is mode. it? Like, I've had it here, and then I've realized recently that you have multiple desktops and so now look at that now all of a sudden I went from no windows to those and these except sometimes these will go on the other one and it's just uh, I get lost I was in panic mode the first time that happened what George is talking about is when you swipe on your computer and it gives you a completely different desktop um, it actually happened during a show but the worst I've ever been panicked was when we worked at first American title somebody sent me something where I opened it and all of a sudden I had my mouse, the cursor, was a penis. And the more you click to get rid of it, the more of them come out. And they were just floating everywhere. And I don't know if you remember where I sat, but I was in a heavily trafficked area. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I mean, just the initial click, like, oh, my God, oh, my God, what's going on? Probably produced about 20 of them before I realized, oh, my God, every time I click, they're, they're multiplying. But I can't just sit there like a sucker and let them fly around. Right. So, I, uh, yeah, that was the most panicked I've ever been. Was it just like a still penis there, or was it like no, it flies. jiggling, dangling, and animated? Yeah, it, it's animated. It's like flying around, almost like a wow. Atari game, and they just Jeez. fly. They flow all over your screen. It was, it was funny, man. <laughs> Those jokes would get played. Remember when people would get uh, well, what was it called when you got Rick Astley? What was his yeah. name? Rick, Rick Astley. Rick rolled. Rick rolled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you you know what that is, Andre the Giant, or are you, are you too young? Of for course, that? that's part of like that was part of me growing up, just getting Rick rolled all. Well, you were like two years old when that <laughs> happened. How, how do you remember that? No, more like sixteen. Sixteen. <laughs> all right, all right. So here's here's the the fun fact of the day, guys. On June twentieth, in two thousand four, the following two things happened: two sequences. Fedor Emelianenko mm. slammed. No, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Kevin Randleman slammed Fedor Emelianenko. That's one of the closest techniques or maneuvers or whatever you want to call it, where I thought, "Oh my God, is he uh, is he alive?" And you're He's not like just Zangief. and you're just not kidding when you're saying it because of the way Kevin Randleman did kind of like that suplex and Fedor Emelianenko just landed on his head and his neck just it looked like it snapped. Well, not only was Fedor okay, pretty soon thereafter. He actually submitted uh, Kevin Randleman, but that was a vicious slam. Right, Goes? Yes. Guess what else happened on the same day? What? Quentin Rampage Jackson slammed um, Ricardo Arona. I did not know they happened on the same that night. Are you sure about that? Yeah, so today is June 20th. We'll forever go down as, you know, the whatever you want to call it, MMA history. What's that happened on Halloween? Our friends at MMA history uh, gave it a name. Just, it's just They just called it Slam Day. June twentieth is Slam Day, but officially June twentieth of two thousand four. So Rick, uh, Ricardo Arona gets slammed while he's triangling um, Quentin Rampage Jackson, and that knocked out Ricardo Arona. That was a vicious slam that happened in the second bout of the night, and later on that night in the main event, Fedor Melianenko slammed. Excuse me, Kevin Randleman slammed Fedor Malianenko, but Fedor Malianenko came back and Kamora, uh, Kevin Randleman, 
but both on the same night. The, the fight card was called Pride Critical Countdown 2004. It was held at the St. Thomas Super Arena. I mean, that would be a fun card to just watch again. It was only seven fights. And you want to hear who was on the fight card? Sure. Kazushi Sakuraba against Antonio Shembri. Quinton Jackson versus uh, uh, Ricardo Arona. Sergey Karatanov versus Se uh, Semi Schilt. Nayoa Ogawa versus Paulo Cesar Silva. Hideko Yoshida versus Mark Hunt. Antonio Rodrigo Noguera versus Heath Herring. Fedor Malinenko versus Kevin Randleman. Look at all the studs, all the legends on that fight card. Man, I could have sworn that. Who was it that got slammed on Halloween? I remember. Well, another great slam ringing. was Hughes and Newton, but when was no, that one? No, this was in Pride because I remember a kid ringing the doorbell, trick or treat. And I, and I was like, oh my God, I don't want to miss this. And then the slam was so bad, I had to tell the kid, hold on, I'll be right there. I thought it was that fight, but I guess I'm wrong. Mm. Yeah, both of them happened on the same night, man. That is nuts. June 20th of 2004. If you ever want to go in the UFC Fight Pass and check out Pride, watch that card, and you'll see uh, some of these great stars that, that still fight today. Like, Quinton Jackson has not retired. He fights over at Bellator, but he has not retired. Sergey Karantanov fights over at Bellator. He has not retired. Mark Hunt. So what happened with him? Did he... He had his last UFC fight, right? I think we he's haven't seen him since the loss to pre Big Pretty. No, we haven't seen him. Is he retired? He never retired that I don't night, think right? So, no. Okay, so we'll call him active. Antonio Rodrigo Nogueira definitely retired. Heath Herring definitely retired. Kevin Randleman no longer with us. Fedor Melianenko just signed to keep fighting at Bellator. So that's one, two, because I'm calling Hunt active. Three with Caritana. Four with Quinton Jackson. Hell, Ricardo Arona never really officially retired, but we know he's done. But there's four of them still chugging along. And this is a card from 15 years ago. Hunt was in December, right? Against who? Big Pretty? Yeah. It was late in 2018. Yeah, I think it was like... Uh, Mark Hunt. Yeah, he lost on the 2nd of December. So it's at six it's months. Unbelievable. And he fought three times in 2018, twice in 17, three in 16, one in 15, two. So he was pretty active there, even well into his 40s. Mark Hunt is now 45 years old. Wow. That's, uh, that's, that's up there, man. So, uh, again, a big shout-out to at MMA History Today. They uh, are friends of ours, and they've been doing this for at least at least the three years that I know. And we've quoted this before, you know, where we basically take what they've put out for that day uh, and made it a part of our show. And Here's another one. Yo on this particular day, June 20th, but this is 2015, Joanna Jędrzejczyk made her first defense of her historic title reign when she battered Jessica Penne in Berlin, oh, Germany. Oh, I remember that. <coughs> yeah. Also on June 20th. You know, this is how you can tell the show, the uh, sports got some history. On June 20th, John Jones wins his fifth straight sorry, his fifth fight in a two-month span when he finishes Parker Porter by knockout in 36 seconds. So that was early John Jones. Well, maybe that one wasn't that big of a <laughs> of an event. I was all excited. I was like, was it Shogun or Vader? Or who was it? Because mm -hmm. I remember that was a quick turnaround. Yeah, but no, I guess this was this was really, really in his early days. Hey, are you going to watch that new Chucky movie? Mm -mm. So they're like rebooting it. Andre, are you going to watch that? Yes, I will. Because Luke Skywalker is Chucky in this one. Yeah. Mark Hamill. Yeah. Um, but didn't you like that movie, George, back when you were younger? Chucky? Yeah. I don't know that I saw it from beginning to end, so I, I couldn't tell you. Oh. All right. I mean, I, I like the concept of it, um, but I and even if I did sit through it, I don't really remember it. But what I'm into is those demons where someone needs to be... Uh, Exercised? Yeah. Like, I feel like that that's... That right but there see that, freaks me that out. Makes Especially me the way when I go home. Paranormal Activity did it. Where I remember we would be <laughs> sitting in the theater, and they would be like, "Hey, honey, will you uh, go outside and, and bring the broom in or whatever?" And you go, "Okay," and they'd go in, and everything be quiet. And she's putting the dishes away, and all of a sudden, remember Paranormal that Activity base. would go, boom, 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 boom. yeah, like that. 
And I remember I would sit in my chair and I'm like, oh, here we fucking go. Because you just don't know when you're going to jump out of your seat, you know? Mm -hmm. But I remember it. But, dude, that's why I pay that money for to have that moment. The good thing is I'm able to shut it off and I don't really have nightmares, really, oh, honestly. Oh, I do. So I can, I can watch three straight of those and go home and I'll sleep. But I can baby. only do it do during those. So, like, Chucky, I don't go home and I'm not, I'm not yeah, like that. Andre. Is that it? I don't look under my bed. You know, like, is the doll back there? I don't do that. But, like, those de demonic movies and stuff like that, those mess me up for, like, about a week. Yeah. Where I hear a noise and I go, whoa, whoa, what is that? No, like, Freddy Krueger, he, he didn't really me mess up the me worst. up. Jason messed me up because Jason, that seemed real life to me. Jason? Yes. Because oh, well, all right, not yeah. that I ever really go camping or anything like that, but it just seemed like, oh, a bunch of people are out camping and some lunatic is chopping them up into pieces. But this other guy, Freddy Krueger... He comes at you when you fall asleep, right? Wasn't that the premise? Yeah, but that's the best premise because everybody has to fall asleep. I don't have to worry about Jason here at the Mandalay Bay. I just got to go camping. Then I got to worry about him. That's cool. Yeah, I'll, but I'll all go I got to do is wake up and it's all over. No, that's the whole point, though. You can't because he kills you before you wake up. But you have to fall asleep. You that's have so to. But what I'm saying is, like, right now, if you told me, guess what, George? When you fall asleep, Freddy Krueger's going to come get you. I'm like, all right, well, fuck him. Let him come get me then. Mm -hmm. No big deal. Because you're telling me what's going to happen. But if you tell me, hey, are you are you going up to Mar Charleston next week? And I go, yeah. Dude, there's been a killer on the loop. Oh, man, that would freak me out. Yeah, but you just don't go. You go, all right, that's cool. I'll just Well, okay, here. let's just say he, Movie's he, over. he's been making his moves through Nevada or something like that. That was where the last one happened. Yeah. I don't know. But that that's a real life. Per well, dude, when Richard Ramirez. Oh, that messed me up. When too. Richard Ramirez was on the hunt, was on the prowl, he was called the Night Stalker. This was in the 80s. And this was, I think stuff was going down throughout California. And I just remember he hit a couple in Mission Viejo. And that's when everyone went, what? Because Mission Viejo is supposedly one of the safest cities in America. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he kind of went South County on everybody. You know, he was doing he was doing his dirt somewhere else. And all of a sudden he did that. I remember everybody going like, whoa, hold on a second here. What's the deal? You know, now you are really like... The, the mom, the dad, everybody's like, did you check the windows? Yeah, did you lock it? Yeah, did you double check it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, everybody was making sure that, uh, you know, you were minding your P's and Q's when it came to that one. Dude, that dude freaked out Southern California pretty that, damn good. That's real life. I get that. But see, the thing that you left out about Freddy Cougar is also, too, when you fall asleep, he's like minus 2,000. You're plus, I mean... The odds are astronomical that you're you're not gonna wake up, Jason. You just don't gotta go to Mount Charleston. You're done. That's what I thought was so scary about that movie. Well, what if you're already there though? What if you're already there at Mount Charleston? Yeah. I think I can outrun Jason. Think so? He's pretty put. He's a well put together gentleman. He didn't strike me as At least for a while. Didn't he strike you like as an imposing figure? Like I'd be more afraid of him. You see when Neil Melanson walks in here, you just go, "God damn, that's a big fella." Dude, Neil is big. You guys don't know this. Okay, the other day when Francis wears big boots too, right? Yeah, when Francis Ngannou was here, Neil was bigger than Francis. Yeah, and he's like, he. I told you the other day, he gave me a hug that hurt. It didn't feel good, and it he was being nice. Neil is a monster, man. He sure is. Now, where was I headed with this? I forget what you weren't. I interrupted you. Oh, okay. I gave a shout out to MMA. Yeah, MMA history, history today. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, Chucky's a punk. Though. So, so what? There's a movie or something? Yeah. So the they're redoing the Child's Play movies, and the new one comes out. Mm. I would say uh, those, if you want to call them demonic or whatever, those freak me out a little bit. And I'll tell you what's, dude. I need to fix this because otherwise I'm gonna be a puss. Mm -hmm. I need to get over my fear of heights. I don't know that you really have I one. I don't have one, but I'm uncomfortable, whereas before it was are, no though. big deal. But it's starting to become uncomfortable. It's starting to become uncomfortable, goes, where if I go on YouTube and I see those people that are on those big, tall buildings, I'm like, oh, boy. It is this weird sensation. Oh, yeah, that happens to me, Where my nuts go into, mm -hmm. into my body. <laughs> And I get butterflies, and I'm just watching, and I'm like, oh, why would they do that? They're crazy. Like, I just don't get it. And and so now, that used to happen when I watched YouTube. Now I don't have to watch YouTube. If I just think about it, all of a sudden I get Me that too. weird feeling. Really? Yeah. Just today, I saw a video of a girl. They were going cliff jumping, whatever that's called, cliff diving. Parkour? Oh. 
and um, she, I guess, was running, and I think she changed her mind at the last second, so she put the brakes, but kind of, like, fell over onto, like, the next ledge. Before she even fell on the next ledge, I had to, like, look away, and my leg was already hurting. I, I do the same thing. And I, and if I go to the Luxor or whatever, and I lean over, I'm going to get dizzy. I feel uncomfortable. But, like, when we're going up here at Foundation Room or whatever, when we're going up the uh, the clear elevator, that doesn't bother me too much. Uh it doesn't bother me too much. The too Eiffel Tower that we went up, like that that <laughs> night, I was a little like, "Oh man, this is weird." Really? But see, I uh, almost want to go back just to, make to see if it does do it to it. me again. And I'll tell you what, you know who was the last person where I, where we get a lot of listeners of this show from all over the world? Shout out to Lucas from France. Mm-hmm. He uh, wrote Love me something, and I'm like literally three months behind on emails. But uh, shout out to Lucas. There was one guy, and I th- I'm pretty sure I got his name right. His name was Ben Barlow. <laughs> yeah. He was a jolly old fella from mm-hmm. uh, England. That was Crossbones. I remember when he came in here, and we pushed him, but he told us you know, what, what he was doing and all that. But he did all of the stuff at the top of the stratosphere. Mm. He goes, I was scared, but I committed to it. He says, I did them all. He goes, they all freaked me the fuck out, <laughs> but I did them all. I just didn't want to stop. And I just wanted to stand up and saw and and, and Dwayne jumped and, off of and the uh, give him a salute like man I I salute you like honestly that's awesome Steve Straub jumped out of a plane and for his fiftieth yeah. birthday there's a lot of people that are just doing this and I I need to figure out how I can do some of that stuff uh, I th- you just do it you just stop thinking about it and you don't give yourself the option that's what I do whenever I'm gonna do something scary I just stop thinking about it and I don't give myself that option that I'm gonna back out like I just here's what scares me with. about jumping out of a plane. Have you ever heard about when they say those people that fall off a building, they're dead before they even hit the ground? Uh, I hadn't heard that. You haven't heard that? Yeah, like uh, yeah. like it's something that messes up with your mind and your stomach and whatnot as you fall. Yeah, so, so by the time you yeah. splat on the ground. They pass out or they die? No, I, well, that's a good question. Maybe it's just passing out. But I always I thought if they meant that they mm-hmm. died just from the fall itself, then when you're jumping out of a plane, why wouldn't you die there? Because you're definitely covering a lot more ground. But the chute will open automatically once you get to a certain, if you haven't pulled it, I think. Right. That's no, no, that's not what I mean. Was What I mean is why haven't you died before the chute opens? Because you're traveling all. I think they pass out. Is that what it is? I don't is? think they die, yeah. Okay. Um, the, o- the thing that I have against skydiving is if I'm going to put my life on the line, I want to do something where if, I, if I'm in a room with 10 people, I don't go, hey, You'll never guess what I did the other day. I jumped out of a plane. I don't want four or five other guys to go, oh, yeah, I've done that. What was the point of all that? So what are you going to do? S- get stung by a box jellyfish? Uh, No, it's just got to be something like, hey, man, I pet a, a tiger the other day or something like that. Put me in a room with ten people. I doubt there's going to be four people that go, me too. It's got to be stuff like I that. I feel like when I tell people like, well, got attacked by gliding, the dogs. Yeah, that's a good one. I feel like when I tell people that. There's less of a chance of somebody going, oh, really? I've never done that than the skydiving one. I feel like more people have done the skydiving deal than the hang gliding deal. Remember the dogs that attacked us in Afghanistan? Yeah. Like, that's another good one. Where if I've ever told people or shown the video, nobody really goes, oh, yeah, me too. I like those type of stories. I'm not going to put my life on the line to tell a story that half of the room's already done as well. Yeah, but apparently it's a pretty amazing rush. Mm. I mean, I've gone this far without it. But the stratosphere thing... I did that. You did it? Yeah, the uh, big shot. Oh, th- I did that one. Yeah. I thought you meant the Dwayne. That, the that's Dwayne one of the worst things I've ever done. You guys don't know, man. Like, I like rides where there's a big drop, but there's something about this really messes with you. When The big shot is at the top of the stratosphere. It looks like the Seattle Space Needle. It does not stop. It just keeps going. You're getting shot up, and you're like, when is this going to stop? That anxiety is way worse than being dropped. How about you the feel like one the clouds like you're just gonna hit the moon? How about the one off the freeway on the way home to California by Victorville? And it's <laughs> oh, that one thing. <laughs> doesn't it look like it's gonna <laughs> shoot you onto the freeway and you're just gonna get ran ran over by cars on top of the I think fall itself. For me, what's more scary about that is that doesn't look like that's their bread and butter. So uh I don't know like how don't often underest- the guy comes Don't to underestimate check on those. Don't what? underestimate those that, that that little movement isn't probably a scary sensation. I'm probably more scared at like a carnival like when the the Orange County Fair on one of those rides than I would be like at Magic Mountain or something because I know Magic Mountain like every day they're checking those things out and things still happen but the carnival you look at the guy that's like that's ushering you in and some geek right when you're just sitting there picking his nose you're like man this dude's responsible for me right now <laughs> did I ever tell you my story about Magic Mountain and my hip 
sounds familiar. Oh, hell, you may have been there. But I just remember Colossus. <laughs> I love that. I got hurt on that, too. You did? Really bad. One of the worst pains in my life. How? Oh, where? Uh, <laughs> stupid, but... Well, all right. Well, when the, the ride ends, the thing that comes down on your lap, the restraint, just pops up. And it pops up so fast. And so when it was done, I had my hands like this. And it just came back and it smashed my fingers. <laughs> it hurts. Really? Like, picture like a piano. You know, they close it. Picture that getting smashed on like your Tom fingers. Cat? That's how I felt. I mean, I was, I think I cried. And I was like well in my 20s. Really? Yeah, that hurt. You would think that that, that that would be something that they fix because I think a lot of people would be in your position. I think it was uh, just right place, right time. And All I remember is on Colossus, my left hip, I believe, would kind of like cramp up. And it was the weirdest sensation. And I thought, hmm. So I remember we would go up on Colossus. My hip would cramp up, and I'd be like, oh, oh, oh. You know? And then you go through the hills and valleys, the ups and downs. Oh, my God, the speed. Wee. But when we got off, it was one of those days where it wasn't that packed. And they're like, hey, you want to get back on? And I was like, sure. There was like about 20 people, wasn't that? And I'm stretching. I'm twisting. I'm like, God, I can't have this happen again. I don't think you were there because I think it was with a girl. And I didn't want to look dumb. But I didn't want to say no because the <laughs> offer was too good. Usually those are like hour or two hour long lines. So you're like, hell yeah, let's run it back. So I'm kind of stretching and twisting. And I'm like, I'll be all right. Maybe I just slept bad. As we go up, it's getting worse. And I'm like, I'm halfway between. I want to cry because of the pain. But I know that that big fall's coming and I want to yell, you know, or, or enjoy that. And I just remember, I'll take off my glasses. In the ride, I did it a third time. When I got off, I was like, what is this? So I remember going, I think I told the girl, I got to go to the bathroom. I went to the restroom, and I really went through like a series of stretches. And I was like, what could that fucking be? Like, why would a roller coaster do that to you? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I don't know if I'm if it was so tense that I was doing it to myself. or Because why would that roller coaster do it? I've been on many roller coasters, and they don't do it. But this one did it. So I go, okay, we got to do it a third time. She was waiting. We go, and I remember on the third one goes, it started tightening up again, and it's a two-minute ride, right? Yeah, about. This is, like, usually I'm like this, ah, two hands up, screaming, like, face is beaming, I'm having fun, right? And on this one, my hands were down, but almost like, like when, you they, a side pain? when a policeman tells you, hands up, you don't completely stretch your hands up, right? You just kind of put them up like a, mm-hmm. almost like a field goal. Yeah. A ref doing a field goal sign so my hands are just like barely up and i'm just like this like oh, like that was me in the whole ride just oh, grimacing cr- i wanted to cry i just wanted to end so bad it was one of the worst two minutes of my life and i i couldn't understand it and i knew i couldn't explain it to her because I, I know she would think that i'm just the biggest dummy on mm-hmm. earth and why am i with this guy but it was the most confusing thing ever man and that's well, it happened why happened to her too right hmm? it happened to her too no but she said that was the worst two minutes of her life, too. When she Goes. <laughs> anyway. All right. We got to take a break. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation, Channel 156. Stay close. We'll be right back. There's still more to talk about. Trust me, there's some big MMA news that's out there.
Both iPhone and Android carry a feature to make their show more enjoyable. It's called the mute button. Here are those two numb nuts, gorgeous George and Goes. You're all getting rickrolled. <laughs> Sirius XM has your chance to see Jimmy Buffett and the Coral Reefer Band in Cincinnati. One grand prize winner will win a trip to Cincinnati, including Air Hotel. Well, there should have been a comma there. Air Hotel VIP tickets to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Access to a pre-show party. You thought it was Plus, an Air Hotel? you'll score uh, a pair of box seats to see the Reds host the Cardinals. For official rules and to enter, go to SiriusXM.com slash Jimmy Buffett before July 8th. No additional purchase is necessary. Don't forget, you can hear concert broadcasts from Jimmy Buffett's Son of a Son of a Sailor High Tide Tour High Tide Tour on Margaritaville Radio, and that's Channel 24 Radio. Uh, Channel 24. Well, that was tricky. Son of a Son of a Sailor High Tide Tour. Hmm. It's probably Son of a Sailor High Tide Tour. They wrote that Think so? Somebody, yeah, messed up there. This almost sounds like a Dan Stupp prize, huh? Two tickets to a Reds game, and yeah. he strikes me as the type of guy that would like Jimmy Buffett. All right, I want to clean something up from I think Monday show or Tuesday show, and uh, we'll be bouncing pretty soon. M- um, the Espies, they're gonna have their show coming up. It's I think like the next week. There's only one day of the year where there's no hockey, baseball, basketball, or football. Hell, if you even want to throw in some of the collegiate sports, and it's the day after the uh, baseball all-star game because you know those that. guys get one extra day before they go and start oh, their new their new uh, series. And, of course, NHL and basketball are not playing because those series are done. Mm-hmm. And football is hasn't started yet either. So it's just baseball. So that's why the ESPYs chose that date back when they started, like 20-some years ago. And the way it works is, even though it's July of 2019 when this will happen, it's a reflective of the 2018 year. I was saying on Monday show, hey, are you sure it's not like June 1st or May 30th, you know, one of those deals? Mm-hmm. It's not. They only did that the first year when they had to basically backtrack like 17 months. But after that, it's been... Whatever date it is, it reflects back on the previous complete year, January to December. So, that being said, with MMA getting its own category for Best Fighter, goes, you tell me who deserves it for 2018. Israel Adesanya went 4-0. He, he beat Rob Wilkinson, Marvin Vittori, Brad Tavares, and Derek Brunson. There was two stoppages and two decisions. Um, one of them was a split decision against Marvin Vittori. You cannot consider the Anderson Silva fight mm-hmm. nor the Kelvin Gastelum fight because they happened in 2019. Okay. Amanda Nunes, she beat Raquel Pennington via TKO punches and Chris Cyborg via KO punch. Um, she became a champ champ when she beat Chris Cyborg because in the Pennington fight, she was defending her title. Henry Cejudo. Listen up, folks. Henry Cejudo in 2018 only fought once. He beat Demetrius Johnson. He won the UFC flyweight title, and he beat arguably the pound-for-pound pound champion at that time. But that was it. You can't consider Dillashaw nor Marias. Uh, and the fight prior to that was Sergio Pettis in December 2017, so he only had the one fight. Daniel Cormier. He went 3-0. and He beat Volkan Ozdemir, so he defended the UFC light heavyweight title. Then he defeated Stipe Miocic, to become the UFC heavyweight champion. That's why he was a simultaneous champ champ. Then he defeated Derek Lewis. So he had one title defense at heavyweight and light heavyweight. Along with the 3-0 and year. Now remember, the ESPYs is fan votes. But the media also gets to vote as well. So who do you think is going to get that prize after what I told you? Not just based on stats alone. But probably also on a little bit of the popularity. Who I think. Or yeah. who I think they're gonna? Pick. No, tell me who, who. I guess tell me who you think. Who would you give it to? I think if I, Goes decided it. I was gonna say Chris, or sorry, not Chris Cyborg, Amanda Nunes. But I, it's hard to deny Daniel Cormier. That's three fights, so it's one more than what Amanda did. Right across two divisions. Right, and he went up a division. So did she. Um, that's. Uh, There's nothing to think about, in my opinion. Yeah, he just had the one more fight, so they both defended. Where they were at, and then they both went up a division to beat an all-time great. Maybe Amanda would have the lead there. 
hey, Cyborg was more of a mythical figure than Stipe. Stipe, you could make an argument that well, he was the he best was on the way to UFC the heavyweight, heavyweight champion ever, but but not like the far and above what Cyborg was. Everybody was like, oh my God, she's the greatest. You know what I mean? And by finish, but so did Daniel. So did Daniel, right? So I would say that if it stopped there, Amanda might have a lead on him, but um, then he went on to beat. Derek Lewis, so he had a title defense. So it's just the three and zero might just be a better than the two and zero, and arguably Daniel Cormier is more popular, and Cejudo just gets left behind because he only had the one fight. Granted, it was pretty epic as well, but mm-hmm. Amanda Nunes is, was as epic as well. Sorry, I didn't even mention Israel Adesanya, but his weren't title fights. He did have a four and zero year, so his four and zero is better than D- DC's three and zero, but his level of competition wasn't championship caliber mm-hmm. no disrespect to those guys they just weren't champions so i think dc might be the one that winds up winning it but that that's how the officially the sbs works in 2019 they're voting on 2018 so how do you think they're gonna vote it though the fans and the media over there i think they'll still do it daniel cormier i think but, so too but what do you uh but are some du- some of them dumb enough to go do you see what Sahudo did he beat dillashaw morass even though it happened in 2019 uh, i don't think so hmm. do you uh can this even be one more little wrinkle that you could add to the goat talk. Mm. You know how you're nitpicking? Yeah. And then you go, yeah, but Cormier's got an SB too. Oh, Can you do no, that? I don't think so. I think it's what they do on the field, in the cage, in the rings mm-hmm. or whatever. All right. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure John might have something. He's been pretty pretty great in himself. Mm-hmm. But All right, folks. So listen up. The MMA Junkie website has a tab there called Rumors. At the top. If you hit that, you'll get all the pertinent information for everything that's going on this weekend. Bellator has a fight card in London. It's kind of confusing because part of the card is called Bellator London and the other one's called Bellator 223. Like they're literally splitting the prelims and the the main card. The prelims can be seen on Saturday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern because they're in London. Time difference. You can watch them live on MMA Junkie. However, <laughs> the main card is on Paramount and the Zone at 9 p.m. Eastern on tape delay. So you literally got to shut it off, go about your Saturday, and then come back and not get spoilers. Um, sucks that it's that way, but it's that way. I don't know what else to say. There's also UFC in South Carolina. And that's headlined by Hanato Moicano versus the Korean Zombie. Um, and we also have Musasi versus Lovato Jr. Holy cow. They're on MMA Junkie as well at 5 p.m. Eastern. What the fuck is going on? How, how did they divide all that? That's Bellator Europe 3. I'm confused. Maybe I'll, we'll straighten all this out tomorrow. And don't forget, BKFC 6 on Fight TV. You can order it from there for 40 bucks with Arda Loboff and Polly Malinaji. Big thanks to our guest today, Johnny Bedford. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, be a champion.